Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the director of the United States Army Heritage and Education Center, Colonel Peter Crane, and the entire staff of the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center and the United States Army War College, welcome to the fourth lecture in the 49th annual Perspectives in Military History Lecture Series. The USAC and the U.S. Army War College sponsor the Perspective Series to provide a historical dimension to the exercise of generalship, strategic leadership, and the warfighting institutions of land power. In addition, we would like to extend a warm thank you to the Army Heritage Center Foundation for their support in everything we do here at the AHIC. Please be aware that the book for tonight is on sale in the gift shop and right behind the room here, and we will have a book signing right after the lecture. All proceeds from the book sale do go to the foundation and support the growth of the Army Heritage and Education Center. Tonight's speaker is Ms. Gail Limon. Ms. Lamont is a senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations and the author of the New York Times bestsellers, Ashley's War, The Untold, Untold Story of a Team of Women on the Special Ops Battlefield, and The Dressmaker of Karakana. She is also a contributor to Atlantic Media's Defense One website. In 2004, she left ABC News to earn her MBA at Harvard, where she began writing about women, women entrepreneurs in conflict and post-conflict zones including both Afghanistan and Rwanda. Following her MBA study, she served as a vice president at the investment firm PIMCO. She has written for Newsweek, the Financial Times, and the International Herald Tribune, as well as the, uh, for the World Bank and the Harvard Business School. She gave a TED Talk on Ashley's War and, it, and the All Women Special Ops teams in May 2015, followed, following on her 2011 TED Talk on the importance of investing in global entrepreneurs. Ashley's War was also recently added to the SOCOM Commander's reading list. A Fulbright Scholar and a Robert Bosch Fellow, Ms. Lemon speaks Spanish, German, French, and is even conversant in Farsi. So hopefully she won't speak Farsi tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Gail Lemon. Thank you. It is really a pleasure to be here because in so many ways this story belongs to you. Uh, this is a story, it's a small slice of history about a group of soldiers who answered the call to serve. And I look forward to sharing it with you tonight. And then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. You can ask me anything, I promise, that between the dressmaker and Ashley's War, there's nothing I haven't been asked. So feel free to uh, go in whatever direction you will. Whether I answer is another question. Uh, but I really look forward to, to sharing this story with you. This story begins with some of the most tested leaders in the special operations community coming to the conclusion that we will never win this war without women. In 2010, nine years into America's longest war, Admiral Olson was in his offices in SOCOM in Tampa and thinking that America had really gotten too far toward the harder skills and gotten too far from the idea of knowledge. And in his view, there was knowledge and information and understanding that was being left on the battlefield every single night, in part because Male soldiers, no matter how good they were at combat, would never be able to enter the quarters and have conversations with half of the population. Half the population remained very much out of reach. And at a time in the war where information and every piece of data and knowledge you could find made the difference between whether that night's mission was successful or not, the idea that America was leaving knowledge on the battlefield bothered Olson. And he had this idea that if we would have women come out on the battlefield, female soldiers would join male soldiers on special operations missions, there would be a whole world that we could access. Because whether you are in southern Pennsylvania or southern Afghanistan, if you want to understand what's happening in a community, who do you talk to? Right? And, and so he came to the conclusion that this was a necessity in terms of a force multiplier. So he had this idea, and then, as he told me, he also had the distinct idea that everybody was simply waiting for the next SOCOM commander to come. But a few months later, Admiral McRaven, who I know some of you are, are, are familiar with, put in a request for forces from his post as JSOC commander in the field. And as Olson and others would say, what a JSOC commander asks for in the middle of war, a JSOC commander receives. And so what happened was, 
Olson's idea of the yin and yang of warfare met McRaven's idea that there was a need for women in a very uh, specific and very tangible way to be out there alongside rangers every single night, night in, night out, met reality. And by the start of 2011, a recruiting poster went up that changed the lives of so many who saw it. And that poster, which is in Ashley's War, uh, in case you want to see it, said, female soldiers become part of history. Join special operations on the battlefield in Afghanistan. And across the globe, at bases from South Carolina to South Korea, from Alabama to Alaska, exactly who you would think of could not raise their hands fast enough. A group of fit and fierce and incredibly motivated, also very funny, uh, soldiers who had always wanted three things, to be at the heart of the fight, alongside the best of the best, and testing their limits in service to something greater than themselves, which in this case was their country. And so you had this group of all-stars who immediately wanted to find their way onto this mission. There was uh, Kate, a West Pointer, who had played high school football all four years. Hated it after the second year. But when little girls would come up to her at the end of football games and say she wanted to be like them, and boys on her team would tell her that girls couldn't play football, she would feel like she had to stay for the next generation. There was Amber, a gal who looked a little bit like uh, one of the Heidi storybook characters. And she grew up in Pennsylvania, not too far from here, grew up shooting targets with her brothers. Didn't know women couldn't go in infantry, so when she enlisted, that was what she was about to put down until they told her she couldn't. So she went to Bosnia, became an intel officer, got as close to the fight as she could, would beg the SEALs and say, listen, you got to take me out. And they would say, listen, you don't have any training to be outside the wire with us. And that made her come back and get as fit as she possibly could be. And when she saw that poster, there was also a Milpers message. I can say that in a military audience. So exciting. Uh, usually I'm around civilians, so I don't get to say that. Uh, but when the, when the Milpers went out, uh, there, was a there were probably four people who sent her that email that announced the program. And at the top was always the same line. I would never do this but this looks perfect for you. <laughs> and each one of those young women had the same experience. There was Lane Mason, an Iraq War veteran who had uh, driven convoys uh, in, during her first deployment, was part of the Guard, did not want to deploy again with her Guard unit, felt that she didn't have full confidence in some of her teammates, and was looking for a way to deploy that would put her out there with people who were uh, the best at what they did. There was Cassie, who was a young woman who managed to be an ROTC cadet, a women's studies minor, and a sorority sister, all in one person. She was also a tennis star. Her parents had been grown up chasing the American dream. They were entrepreneurs. And on her 16th birthday, they offered her a Ford Mustang, which she turned down and asked for a Ford pickup. There was a Tristan, who was another West Point track star. So many of these young women were just intense and incredible athleticism. She could have gone anywhere on a track scholarship, but chose West Point because she fell in love with its beauty and with the idea of the service. And she was famous in that group for running and ruck marching with no socks. And every roommate she had could tell you the perfume that her shoes would leave in their wake as a result of mar marching and running miles and miles with absolutely nothing between her foot and her shoe. So this group of young women came together, and at the heart of them was uh, Lieutenant Ashley White, a guard member in North Carolina, who was, as every single person would tell you, the best of us. Just intensely quiet, would never tell you how good she was. But when it came time to do the PT test, she was the one who would blow everybody out of the water. Forget the female chart. She was well above most men on uh, the male index. She ended up being this strange combination for a lot of people of uh, Martha Stewart and G.I. Jane. She was someone who loved to cook dinner for her husband, who was her ROTC Kent State sweetheart, and pushed her to test every limit she had. She also loved to put 40 or 45 pounds of weight on her back and march for miles in Ravenna Arsenal near her home in Ohio. She was someone who, if you forgot your boots 
or if you forgot your lunch, she would be the first person that you called. And when this group of young women came together, about 200 people put in their packets. About 110 are invited to Fort Bragg, which is a part of North Carolina some of you might know well. And about, about 55 at a time are brought to, welcome, are brought to uh, the Landmark Inn on Fort Bragg for in processing. And in that moment of getting their paperwork together, the very first morning they're all at the Landmark Inn, which is this uh, motel hotel on post, they all have the same experience, which is they walk into the breakfast room, you know, the kind with make your own waffles and the thing you pull down to get your milk, and they realize they all stop before going any further because they have never been in a room with 55 people just like themselves. All of these young women had been so used to being in ones and twos or threes or fours in a much greater sea of men who were high achieving. They had never been around 55 young women who were as intense and as driven and as motivated as they were. And as one of them said, it was like realizing you were not the only giraffe at the zoo. You know, they had never been in a room where they could celebrate who they were without having to apologize for what they wanted to do. And so for these young women, they found community at the same moment in which they were coming together to compete for a spot on the special operations team, which was more or less a quiet team because A, it was special operations, and B, the combat ban was very much in place. This was 2011. So you ask what I first question was, so how were women there? Well, as Amarols and I discussed, legally, women could not be assigned to special operations combat teams, but they could be attached to any team. And in that difference between attachment and being assigned was the creation of the cultural support team, which was an incredibly benign name for a groundbreaking concept. Now, you may ask what I did, which is, where in the world did that name come from? So in our conversations with some of the special operations leaders, we discussed this. And they said, he said, oh, no, there was no science to it. It was simply the, the best of a bunch of bad options. Uh, cultural came from the fact that it was culture that was the reason why male soldiers could not speak to women and why this security gap existed. Right? Support was because there were so many people who feared that this was a backdoor way to make women frontline operators that they thought they would address that in the name. And team was because everything in special operations is a team. So that is how this team was born. And I want to pause for a moment and say it's very important to note that women have been doing these roles for years. Medics, Convoy drivers first, uh, and you'll see the first, first chapter of Ashley's War really talks about this history. For years, women who were medics or uh, doing any other kind of role were seconded. And people would say, hey, do you want to go out on mission with us? Hey, can you come uh, and go talk to women when we go out tonight? And uh, as Ashley White's roommate we found in Kandahar, she was a medic who one day somebody came in, her commander, but somebody had asked her commander to do it, and said, hey, do you want to go get bad guys? And that was her full introduction to going on special operations missions. So this group of women came together for what was called 100 Hours of Hell, which was a very inviting name for the selection process that was happening at Camp McCall, which is where special forces assessment and selection occurs. And there were all kinds of tests, from climbing 30-foot walls to shimmying under uh, metal coils to uh, buddy carries, and could you carry your buddy off the battlefield, uh, and to real mental and, and, and uh, emotional agility tests. Simulate an Afghan home in which you will try to de-escalate the situation. Because what these women would be doing out there every single night, particularly on the direct action side with the Army Rangers and Navy SEALs, was to be out on special operations missions looking for people, place, and things that were in support of the insurgency, then uh, very much threatening the Afghan government. And it was fascinating because what you saw was that these young women were brought to Fort Bragg. They were tr selected in either March or May, trained in June and July, and by August would be seeing the kind of combat experienced by less than 5% of the entire United States military. So they choose 
55 out of the original 200 plus, and of those 55, 20 will be chosen for those Ranger and SEAL missions. And they go to pre-mission training, and they meet their trainer, who has a whole chapter in Ashley's War simply because he is maybe one of the best and most colorful interviews I've ever had in my life. And I will not quote him because you would be bleeping me out for much of this uh, discussion if I were to do so. So he is at Fort Benning. He was a ranger who had done 12 deployments in the post-9-11 wars, equivalent of three and a half to four years of combat, depending on the shortened mission time. And he was at Fort Benning one day. He had blown his knee out uh, in Iraq while working uh, under General McChrystal in Balat. And one day, he's at Fort Benning, and they say, hey, you got to go train girls. <laughs> you can imagine the reaction. He said, what am I supposed to train them in? And he said, just train them in what you train other enablers. So being a, 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 a person with a great sense of humor and a good sport, he said, all right, well, you know, let's see. Let's see. He knew how to do his job well comes to Fort Benning and he's training them in a special operations area uh, just outside and he realizes immediately that they care. That these young women are listening to his talk on combat mindset with every muscle, with every fiber, and that they will become his team. First day out on the range, he takes them out and he's training them in, in their weapons. And he teaches them how to stand. He teaches them how, to, how he wants them to uh, approach a weapon and how to shoot. Uh, and a lot of MPs had already done this. But even for the people who had, were convoy drivers and others who hadn't done it, he went through everything step by step. And he's talking to Lane Mason, and he tells her what she needs to do. And he walks away. And three minutes later, he comes back, and she's doing exactly what he said. He said, wait a minute. Why are you doing what I told you to do? She said, well, you told me, she said, I don't understand the question you told me. He said, listen, as he told me in one of our interviews, uh, American men think they are very good at three things. Driving a car, making love to their woman, and shooting a weapon. And he said, I only cared about the last one, but that kept me plenty busy all the time. Because these 19-year-old kids would come in, and they would say, my daddy taught me to shoot this way. My grandpa taught me how to shoot this way. They all had seen lethal weapons, so they would start like that. And he would just have to unlearn. I mean, this was somebody who was a small arms champion. He knew whereof he spoke. And he said, you know, this was the first time I would tell him, and I'd walk away, and they would do it. He said, and I'm never going back to training anybody else again. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, he, for him, this was really an eye-opener. He never expected to become the champion of this group of uh, unlikely warriors to be sitting in the special operations community in 2011. But, you know, he goes through days and days like this. He brings the rope down to do a, a, um, a rope climb. One gets up, falls. One gets up, falls, about halfway up. And then here comes little Ashley White, who was barely five foot three, and as he said, had the smile of a Disneyland greeter. And there she went up and down and up and down and up and down the full length of the 18-foot rope using only her arms, which he had never seen. And he said, you know, nobody else try this because, the, you know, that's not what we're teaching you, uh, but that's amazing. And as it turned out, she was very used to carrying her body weight because she was a gymnast. She had her entire life carried her body weight, and she was, like most of these young women, incredibly fit and in the gym three times a day doing CrossFit workouts. So this, for her, was not a surprise. But in true Ashley White fashion, she walked away and looked at him and said, I'm so sorry. I know we were supposed to use both our arms and our legs. He said, no, no problem. Just for you, it's OK. Uh, and at the end of his time training them, he only had eight days, and he really worried that was not enough, right? I mean. But this was, I think it's very important to note, a plane being built in mid-flight. It was 2011. The war was not going well. Everybody wanted solutions. And so what this uh, group of young women was going out to do was to be, in some ways, a test program to see, would this work? Could this make a difference? And by the end of his eight days training them, they are his team. And he turns to another ranger who he's working with and says, you know what? These girls may one day be our own Tuskegee Airmen. They're going to make history, and no one knows they exist. So they all go off to Afghanistan, and 
the first uh, part of this, as, as we jokingly called it in the book, was Operation Fit In. Because you can imagine if you're a ranger who's done 9, 10, 11, 12 deployments, and someone comes up to you and says, there's a new soldier you have to take out and give us precious spot on your helicopter to. Different recruiting cycle, different training cycle. Oh, and by the way, they're female. You can imagine the skepticism that initially greeted it. But as one of the CSTs found, a lot of the senior guys had wanted this capability for years. And so as one uh, ranger uh, came up to one of the young women and said, listen, some people may give you a hard time, but most, most all of us want you here. And if everybody gives you a tough time, come see me. And just that act of leadership made her realize that there was, they didn't have, it wasn't that everybody hated them. It was that everybody was trying to do their job to the best. And all these young women wanted to do, all these soldiers thought about was making a difference immediately to show why they were there. And I think for, for a lot of them, it was very important to state this was never about proving a point. It was about serving with purpose, and it was about patriotism. And so one of the first nights out, they board the helicopter in the dark of night. They go, Afghan forces and the rangers, they go out onto the uh, target objective. They're looking for the, at this point, it was an insurgent who was uh, suspected to be part of a, an attack that was coming up. And Amber is out, the Pennsylvania native, and she's out, and all of a sudden on the radio, the rangers go in, they call out, uh, the rangers go in, they're talking to the men of the house, they're trying to find the thing that they're looking for and the people they're seeking, and Amber is talking to the women of the house. And she realizes that the ranger on the radio asking her for the count, how many men, how many women, how many children? So she says, you know, uh, five men, four women, 10 children, remember the count was. And they get back on the radio and they say, no, tell us again. So she says, five men, four women, 10 children. And they're asking her a third time. And she said, what is going on? Do they think that I don't know how to do my job? She said, but who cares? Just she answers the question. And it's not until they have an extraction in daylight, because things had gotten very tricky throughout the night, that she realizes that the difference between her count, which was five, and theirs, which was four, was a barricaded shooter who was lying in wait for Afghan and American forces as they entered the home. And so when they went back at night, you know, the, the ranger doing the, the uh, post-mission brief said, hey, you know, good job getting information. And, and just that was enough to break the ice for so many people. And that happened night in and night out. Kimberly, a, a military police officer, was with a team of SEALs who was, they were not incredibly excited at the outset to take her out on mission. But she's pretty tough, and they would give rib each other, and so they took her out. And that night one of the first or second nights that they were out, she found uh, the intel item they were seeking wrapped up in a baby's wet diaper in the women's quarters, right? Uh, another night, it was Tristan who was out with her sealed, with a uh, ranger platoon, and they said, hey, we're going to go to the next place. And she said, listen, I want 10 more minutes. Is that okay? And the ranger said, yeah, yeah, but no more because things could get dicey. And in that 10 minutes, the woman that she'd been talking to, it comes out, that there are IEDs in place all the way between where they are then and where they are going to be that night. So part of the leadership lesson of this was that the leadership set the tone. The second piece was that the transparency of that mission set fostered integration. You could quickly point to what these young women had done immediately to help find the person or the item that they were looking for, and it made a difference quickly. The other thing that I think is important to know is that friendship was at the heart of this. Because as much as this was a war story and a love story, it was also a story of friendship. Because these young women started as teammates, became friends, and really ended as family, the likes of which no one will ever understand and they will never experience again. They would get together, it was hard at the outset, to lose that camaraderie because they were in ones and twos and bases all across Afghanistan. And one of the early uh, notes, they figured out that if they would do video teleconferences, they could share and swap stories. So they would talk about things that were working. They would talk about things that weren't working. They were talking about how to use the restroom on mission, right, which was a female, you know, was not something that a lot of women had done before. So what do you do? There was a shiwi which I'll leave to your imagination. Uh, and did that work? So it would have all these conversations. And it was funny because a, um, 
a special forces uh, friend read the book early, probably a month and a half or so before it came out. And he called me and he said, Gail, I really like the book, as if you were really surprised. Uh, and I said, oh, I think that's a compliment. And uh, he said, no, no, I really like it. But there's a typo on page uh, 169. It says S-P-A-N-X. I'll let you get that joke. For the men in the audience, that is not a typo. That's Spanx, which is an undergarment that a lot of women wear under clothing to make clothing fit better. And Ashley's War really is, has to be among the first war stories to ever have Spanx uh, in its pages. But what had happened was that, back to this being a plane built in mid-flight, the uniforms that they were given, the CSTs, were given Ranger uniforms, and they were honored to wear. There's a whole moment in Ashley's War where they're unpacking the cries that have come in for them, right? Because they have uh, elbow pads and knee pads. They have much more Velcro. They make much more sense when you're doing this kind of a mission, night in and night out. And so they're really excited when they get them, but they're built for men's bodies, right? So they're big where they should be small and small where they should be big. Ashley White's pants were so big, they came up to her rib, rib cage, and a ranger actually loaned, him, or loaned her suspenders to wear, and it became her sort of trademark. Uh, and Lane Mason, the Iraq veteran, uh, she realized immediately that her pants were never going to fit. They were not comfortable. They were too small. And so she went on to Amazon.com and ordered to her base in eastern Afghanistan a pair of Spanx that she wore every single night out on mission, night in and night out. And the truth was that they really were a learning curve for everyone. But as one Ranger First Sergeant who did, uh, retired now, who did 13 deployments said to me, I think, yeah, a job well done stands out. I do not care who's doing it. A lot of times uh, people will ask uh, about the interpreters. And Ashley Weiss and, and her was uh, also friends with Anne, who was her partner, who uh, was someone who was incredibly athletic, track star in her own right, and had received a bronze star medal with the V device for valor during her 2009 deployment to Afghanistan. She would not let me put that next to her name in the book, so I tell this to you uh, as, as an added note. Uh, because she always felt enormous guilt for what had happened on that mission where she led uh, her forces through 36-hour firefight with uh, the Taliban, but an RPG had gone through her truck and killed her teammate, a soldier who worked under her, and that is what she remembered from that deployment. She never felt she deserved the commendation, the award that she received for that. So there's a moment there when... Um, she uh, is, is arriving, and they realize who their translator is. They're in the ladies' room. Yes, there's a ladies' mo room moment in Ashley's War. And they're in the, the, what has become a female restroom in their base in Kandahar. And Anne, who is very blonde, was out to putting eyebrow pencil on before a combat mission brief. And Sarah, who's not in the, her interpreter, comes out and goes, Oh, my God, I'm so glad you wear makeup. And they have this really funny and human moment because the truth is that these young women brought their whole selves to war. So many times in our stories and on our screens, we see exactly one dimension of the women who are in it. They are either very smart or very nice. They're either very fit or very kind. They're either very intense or very loving. And the truth was, with these young women, they absolutely lived in the and. They showed, by example, and by what they did every single night, that you could wear body armor and eyebrow pencil, that you could do CrossFit and be really good at cross-stitch, that you could paint your nails and be tough as nails, and one did not make you less serious for the other. Ashley White was somebody who had a bread maker in her office in Kandahar and would make raisin bread for the Rangers and her teammates. And then she would go to the gym and bust out 25 or 30 pull-ups from a dead hang. Or she would climb rope using only her arms, and she would run around the base in kit on nights when they wouldn't go out. And I think they really did, for me, you know, some people say, well, why would you put that makeup in that makes them look less serious? And I said, no, 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 that's on us. That's not on them. 
These young women were soldiers out there on special operations missions every night proving themselves. What more did they have to prove? It's we who have to change. And I think part of that is through stories. So all of this happens, and, and they're really making inroads, and they are family. And on October 22nd, 2011, First Lieutenant Ashley White was killed in action alongside Sergeant First Class Christopher DeMay on his 14th deployment and Private First Class Christopher Horns on his first. And her death threw into the very public spotlight a program that had been built for the shadows. Because after all, the combat ban was in place. What was America going to do when it realized that a young female soldier has died alongside two rangers on a special operations raid in Afghanistan in 2011? And the truth was, America barely noticed. Because we are so divorced from the wars that are fought in our name that it barely punctures people's daily realities. And precious few people noticed or had conversations about the fact that there was a young woman right there uh, who happened to be in uniform next to two young men in uniform. And at her funeral, the head of Army Special Operations at the time, General Mulholland, came and gave a very moving speech, which is in Ashley's War, giving a very public reckoning for this program which had been built for the Special Operations community. And he said, make no mistake about it. These women are warriors. And they've written a new chapter in what it means to be a female in the United States Army, the finest army in the world. Ashley White's parents had no idea what she was doing. She had wanted to protect them, just like so many rangers had never really told their mothers what they were doing. She hadn't wanted them to worry. She came from a beautiful family in Ohio, and her dear friend there in Afghanistan was Nadia, her interpreter, who was a young woman who had grown up in Southern California among an Afghan family that had never wanted her to go back to Afghanistan, ever. When she graduated from college, she told her mother that she was going to go to uh, Afghanistan to do a humanitarian mission. And what happened was that she landed, and 36 hours later, she was translating 12 hours on and 12 hours off for Bagram detainees. And at the beginning, she would come home and cry after every session because she was not prepared. She was a civilian a day ago, right? And she still was. And all of a sudden, she is in this world of war. And she comes back and she'd cry every night. And much to her own dismay, a couple months in, she stops crying. She becomes like everybody else. The war becomes routine. And when she goes home to Orange County for a wedding in the Afghan-American community, everybody says, you know, you are no fun anymore. You used to be so cool. You would go to the mall with us. You were so much fun. And now all you do is talk about war and how people are dying. And she said, because you all are clueless. You all have no idea that people are fighting a war in your name. And she feels so disjointed that the only people that she feels connected to by the end are Ashley and her teammates. And she herself is almost killed. She is injured very badly in the IED blast that claims the lives of the two Rangers and Lieutenant White. And after General Mulholland's speech, there's a lot of conversation about will the program continue, and everyone is asking Lita, their officer in charge, who was a high school teacher who then came out of the reserves. She was a major when they found out that the CST program existed, and they said, well, will you be the officer in charge? And she said, oh, no, only if I can do my own mission set. So General Mahalan signs off. She then uh, becomes the person to whom, uh, who accompanies uh, Ashley back home, and what she finds is that everybody is asking her, do you want to keep doing this? Do you want to keep doing this mission? And her answer is, nothing would insult Ashley's memory more than stopping this mission. She was a soldier, and she understood what the risk was. But one of the things that I think made the biggest difference for her family was the community's reaction. Vietnam veterans, Korean veterans, Children, five, six, seven, eight, line the streets to accompany her home. And at the end of two days of mourning, a woman came up to Mrs. White, who she still does not know, 
And she stopped her at the casket right after the funeral. And she said, Mrs. White, I brought my daughter here today because I wanted her to know what a hero was. And I wanted her to know that heroes could be women, too. In January 2013, the combat ban was lifted. And in June of 2013, in a press conference that precious few people noticed, one of the leaders of special operations community gave a press conference about how women were going to become rangers and seals and what was the process for that. And at that press conference, he gave a shout out to Ashley and Lane and Amber and all of these teammates. And he said, you know, the, this is this quote, the, the girls of the cultural, the young girls of the cultural support team have performed tremendously on the battlefield. And the final part of that sentence was, and they may well have laid the foundation for ultimate integration. Even if America hadn't noticed, special operations community leaders had. And those young women understood that they had to perform, not just for themselves, but for everybody who would come after them. They stood on the shoulders of all of those who had come before and alongside the incredible men alongside whom they considered it a privilege to serve. And I think, for me, Ashley's War echoes the mission of this institution of Use the Hack Here to make certain that we honor soldiers past and present and that their stories are never forgotten to the battlefield. As the poem for the fallen states, they shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. The idea behind Ashley's War was to make certain that we remember our heroes, whoever they may be, and that perhaps one day the flags of our daughters will fly alongside the flags of our sons. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we have plenty of time for questions and answers, so if you'll please raise your hand. We'll come to you with the microphone. Please wait till we get to you with the microphone. There, we've got one right over here. Uh, I need uh, a little clarity on one detail. Since the women American soldiers didn't speak the local yeah. Afghan dialects, so on every mission that they were on, they had a female interpreter with them? Some, most of the time, but female soldiers. So there's a whole chapter of Nadia, who is the Afghan-American interpreter I was just speaking of. Uh, she was particularly um, talented and skilled because in interpreters who could speak perfect Pashto as she could and perfect American English as she could were incredibly uh, skilled and needed, right? But there was a shortage of them. There had been a shortage throughout the war of very good Pashto speakers who could also speak Dari. And this was an issue that the United States military faced from the start until the end of combat operations in Afghanistan. So whenever they could, they would take uh, female interpreters out. It was why an interpreter uh, like Nadia mattered so very much. But there were other times where they would use uh, Afghans who were uh, from Afghanistan, who uh, had were either male or female, many of whom had by this time, 2010, 2011, had long worked for, for international forces operating in their country. Yeah. Hello again. Uh, question for you. How, really, how new was yeah. this? Because uh, I, at least as far back, and I know before then, but my own experience in 2003, 2004 in Iraq, out of necessity, uh, women were out conducting patrols um, with various units. So uh, 
Can you speak to that? Absolutely. It's an excellent question. And the whole first chapter of Ashley's War is about the history. And I have to tell you, I felt this enormous responsibility for this whole story, um, just for the fact that people were really trusting you with some of the funniest, some of the most heartbreaking, and some of the most uh, moving moments of their lives. And what would come up over and over again was that this wasn't terribly new. What was new about it was that women were recruited, trained, and deployed as a team for special operations direct action missions for which they would be going on. And they were recruited from throughout the Army Guard and Reserve in a formal process. Uh, the Lioness program in Iraq in 2003 had been working with conventional forces. Uh, the Marines, female engagement teams in 09-ish uh, had also come into being. And special operations had long used uh, civil affairs, PSYOPs, other women uh, who had been part of the special operations community for years. And in fact, as McChrystal and I were discussing, you know, this was, you know, women had been in Delta. Women had been in part of this war for years. Um, but what was different about this was a formal recruitment of an all-women team specifically for this mission and for those kinds of missions. And for, you know, it's funny because for a lot of these young men, these women were, these female soldiers were more of a curiosity, you know, uh, one night, this young ranger said to uh, one of the female captains, so I didn't know women could be officers, right? <laughs> and, and he wasn't trying to be at all a jerk. He just had never been around it. So it was, I think, for the special operations community, um, a new phenomenon to be taking them out in day, to have, for them to have a seat on the bird night in and, and night out. And it was funny, you know, McChrystal joked that, General McChrystal joked that, um, Oh, I said, well, did it surprise you that the Rangers were actually very uh, adept at integrating female soldiers into what they were doing? And we had a whole long conversation about how the Rangers themselves had changed a great deal in the post-9-11 wars, that they had started uh, as sort of the little brothers, even though they all hate that when I say it, but of the special operations community pulling security. And really, by the time a crystal is running JSOC, or Joint Special Operations Command, um, they are having their own objectives you know, several times a night. What, what operations that had taken days to plan in previous lives were then going uh, sometimes in hours. And so they were all about the mission, and that was what mattered. Do you add value? If you add value, you have a seat. If you do not, you're out. And I think for the, for the Ranger community, that, that was what was new. But there was a, a, a civil affairs uh, officer who was incredibly well thought of, who had sort of paved the way, who had been there out on those kinds of missions for a very long time and had proved her own, proved to them the value of that. So it had all happened in one-offs and with precious little training. Previous things. Yeah. Okay. We'll go there. Yeah. Do you have any description in your book on how a woman would prepare herself to do something like that? Yes, because it's one word. It's just CrossFit. Uh, uh, no, I mean, you know, it's funny because this was such a self selecting group. Um, I was speaking with. Uh, some special operations leaders about it who hadn't gotten to meet them. And so they had created the program and then retired. So we were having this whole conversation. So what are they like? I said, well, they're very fit. They're very driven. They're all people exactly who you would expect, right, in terms of being very intense, being very funny, you know, kind of gallows humorish. And he said, so they're basically like the men. I said, yeah. And, and he said, you know, because one of the, he said, you know, the thing is with special operations, what we look for is physically fit problem solvers. And I think that applies to these young women. I mean, they, they, we were never going to recreate the fitness level and the intensity level of that group in mass, right? But there were definitely young people who had always wanted to serve in the heart of what their country was doing and to answer that call to serve. And that was all they were seeking. And for them, when they said, you have the chance to go on ranger missions, there's a scene in Ashley's War where they're watching this recruiting video. And, you know, they're all like, oh, my God, you know, this is it. And it was entirely self-selecting, right? They were the people who, you know, many of us would see that and say, never, <laughs> no chance, right? And, and for them, it was like, how do I sign up? And I can't get there fast enough. Uh, and, and I will say at the end, that's what you'll see in the epilogue of Ashley's War, the most heartbreaking thing was that at the end of their tour, one of the leaders of special operations comes and says at Bagram, in Afghanistan, you've done an amazing job. Thank you. 
we're so proud. Thank you for doing this. We all, you, we've done terrific work. And Kate, the West Pointer, says, so how do we sign up again? What's next? And he said, I don't have an MOS. I don't have a MOS for you. I don't have a budget for you. It's a one-year rotation. And that was it. And so they were in the situation where four days after being on a ranger mission, they were back in cubicles, some of them, in conventional army roles, working with people who had no idea what they had done for the past year. And so that community became, for them, they became, already they were, but that family that they had created became even more important because they were the only people who knew what they had seen and done in America's service. And they became each other's baby shower hosts, divorce therapists, career coaches, rabbis, priests, confessors, the person that they text at 11 at night, and the person they still call at 6 AM if something good happens, because there was no place for them to go. And they were all they had. I mean, they would have been that way anyway, but I think the loss of being part of that community the fact that they couldn't go back and keep doing that mission is, you know, they would have wrecked their careers, every single one of them, and kept doing it because they loved it. And, and so many have gotten out since because what would ever match up after that if that's who you are? Hands here. Did any of the people that you interviewed, male or female, express any opinions about further integration outside of the special ops community and or whether women should be in selective service? So both of those questions came up all the time. Uh, and it was funny because um, I will show my true ignorance by saying that I had no idea this was at all a quote unquote controversial topic to write about when I started writing about it. For me, it was just a great war story we hadn't heard. And it was a way to connect Americans with the war being fought in their name to which they had grown so disconnected that they barely remembered it was going on. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan with my first book and I felt very passionately that that is not okay in a democracy and a citizenry must feel the weight of the wars that, that is, are being waged. So, I, you know, I had no idea that people bring this, you know, I'd never covered this issue. It was not something that, you know, Quite honestly, the whole topic, women in combat, is just like, it makes your eyes glaze over. It has nothing to do with soldiers on the ground, you know, doing things, uh, serving their country. It is this abstract, and I say this as a think tank person. It is a think tank conversation that happens in fancy rooms and fancy places and is almost utterly divorced from what women have been doing for the past, you know, 50 years of war and beyond. <laughs> And I say that as, as, a, as a stranger to the conversation, right? I mean, people would come up with some crazy conversations. But in terms of your direct question, yeah, people would always tell me. era, thank you. I think so many times now in the social media era, we are looking for all our answers, but that's not my job. My job is to make you ask the questions and to question your assumptions and to tell you a story that opens your eyes to things that have been going on all around you with so few of us, including myself, having any idea. So that, people would say to me all kinds of things, all kinds of views, and I welcome that, you know, have you? absolutely. Um, but what the story was about, you know, somebody wrote me on Instagram, speaking of social media era, somebody wrote me on Instagram, I'm so uh, proud of you for taking on this controversial topic. And I wrote back, I'm still looking for the controversy. Because if I tell you I set out to write a story about a set of Americans who answered when special operations said, we have a security gap on the battlefield in our longest war and we need you. And I wanted to write about their friendship, their connections to one another forever, and the fact that they wanted to serve without question uh, and were new at their job. There's nothing inherently controversial about that unless I tell you they were female. 
And so that, to me, was never what the story was about, ever. It was just about a slice of history we didn't, as a country, know. And, and the other part of that was people would always say, well, what about the men? They must have hated them, and they must have given them such a hard time. And I'd say, well, you know, actually, there were a couple of stories. But generally, these were all very professional people who were there to do a job and to accomplish a mission. And if you helped bring us home that night, if what you found, the person or the thing, helped bring us home that night and helped us get the job done, you're part of the team. And that seemed to surprise people, too. So, I mean, I hope that the, this story does move people. And I've just been incredibly moved by the, by the response uh, so far. And I'm humbled by it. And it's a testament to the people in the pages. Good questions here. The Strategic Land Power Task Force has identified that the human domain is key to the Army's ability to succeed in current conflicts that we're engaged in. So what you identify in Ashley's war and Ashley's mission specifically, you talked about the importance of her team being able to show or prove their value. It's a lot easier to do on a direct action mission where you're trying to locate you know, something in a diaper or actionable intel. I'm curious to know your opinion on the importance of using females to engage in the human domain to help us be successful as an army mm -hmm. in current conflicts, specifically, too, in relation to your experience with the Dressmaker yeah. book that you wrote also. So the first book I did was called The Dressmaker of Karkana, and it was about a teenager who supported her business, her business supported her family under the Taliban. All these young women who were entrepreneurs who managed to be breadwinners during years in which they couldn't be on their own streets. And it was a, just one small story that was a testament to so much courage that you would see when you talk to young men, young women, families uh, on the ground. And, you know, I don't know, to me, this has always been, and maybe it's the, the business side of me too, this has always been a talent issue. If to protect and defend and the national security imperative to me has always been about finding the right person for the right job, and whoever is best is out there, and making sure that you have as much information as possible, given the changing war and the changing nature of the people who fight those wars, right? That we have to be able to, to match that. And, you know, look at, you know, there were two or three of the soldiers in Ashley's war were in, uh, um, Tristan, for example, in field artillery. She was an XO in field artillery in a job that was officially coded for men years before that role had opened to women because her commander, the day she arrived, said, hey, you know, here's your job. And she said, wait, that's supposed to be men only. And he said, whatever. You know, I mean, for him, he was fighting a war. It was totally irrelevant. And he said, you know, your HR, you know, your file will look lousy, but we'll go back and fix it. Um, and the engineer was, uh, who's finished sapper school also, right? Um, she was another person who was uh, the number two. And her engineering, uh, because they wanted somebody who they could trust, and her colonel had, had worked with her in Afghanistan and had seen what had happened in that firefight and had been, she had been one of the people, one of the young leaders he trusted. Uh, and so I think this has been going on for years. Right, that people would put the right people in the best job. And I mean, for me, it's just a question of you don't want to go into war with one eye open and one eye closed. Right? You want to be able to see everything that's happening around you. And, and it does not look like the nature of the wars that we are going to fight is going to change dramatically from the ones that we have fought this last 10 years, unfortunately. That's my take. Here and then we'll go. I got gotcha. you. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, <clears throat> with the research that you did in Afghanistan for this book, did you have any sense for the impact of these women, not only on the U.S. Yeah. operations, but on those communities? Yeah. Can you speak to that? So I want to be clear. I mean, this was war, right? So, um, and, and as I was talking about in the first part of uh, Ashley's war, right, this was not a, a heart's 
and mine's mission that they were going on. You know, the ranger trainer says, you know, you're not there to give out hugs and cookies. You're there that if the person you're talking to happens to be a man in a burqa coming at you or threatening to blow up everybody, that you're going to be able to shoot them in the face in three minutes, in, you know, whatever, the, 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 the 15 seconds that you have, whatever it was. Right? I mean, so I want it to be clear that I don't want to sugarcoat any of this, but was it true that there was somebody for women to talk to? Absolutely. Right, so one night, uh, the, not, when I was Sarah, who was one of the, uh, another military police officer, had wanted to be a doctor or a nun or an army officer and ended up becoming a, an MP. Her dad is, you know, to her, she, she didn't want to become a doctor because she felt like it was too far from the front lines. So she became an MP because she wanted to get as close to it as women could at the time. Uh, she goes in one, you know, she's on a mission one night. She was somebody who would genuinely would go out with, you know, whatever, 60 pounds plus on her back and would come home and make T-shirts from old uniforms that she would send back to her family. Uh, and she would take socks with her that people from her church had donated for the kids that she was encountering every night, socks and clothing because she was finding children that she thought were too cold and she wanted to give them something warm. Um, so she comes in one night, they've been watching this on ISR, there's an insurgent who's been either with a family or holding them captive, they couldn't tell the ISR from the overhead view all day. And she comes in and the woman of the house says, I'm so glad you're here because this guy burst into our house, he's threatened, you know, made us feed him all the food that we had, and he's threatening to kill all of us if we don't give him safe haven. And you have to get, you know, you have to get my husband away from because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what he's going to do. And the fact that she had Sarah, to, this woman had Sarah to talk to, meant that they could, she could bring that information to the rangers. It matched what the rangers were finding, and they could all get the insurgent who uh, they actually had been looking for out of the scene and leave the family in peace. Right? The family had been targeted simply for being in the wrong place uh, at the wrong time. They had a nice house. Um, and so that's why he had come. And so that information that there was somebody to talk to, another night, Kate, the West Pointer, goes in, and the, the woman of the house says to her, one of the women uh, who was the most, uh, the most elder of the house said, you know, I don't know why you're here. The guy you're looking for is two compounds over. Right? And, and that information, right, which the Rangers had, was, you know, having these whole kind of circular conversations, and there's a whole question about identity, and that conversation fed into everything else that was happening, and it, as it turned out, the woman was 100% accurate. She was trying to get rid of them, and she was quite right that the person they were seeking uh, was two houses over, right? And so that happened night in and night out, that there was, you know, because these women were never going to talk to big, you know, American uh, special operations soldiers in full kit. Um, who, as they said, looked like space aliens, right, when they would come in. And the CSTs, for better or for worse, right, part of their mission was to take off their helmet. And one ranger said to Amber one night, I never take my helmet off in a mission. Are you crazy? And she said, well, that's part of our job, right? So their job was, sometimes the rooms were cleared, sometimes they weren't, were to go in and have those conversations to make sure nothing was being hidden in women's quarters or that men weren't dressed as, disguised as women, and to have those kinds of conversations. And so, you know, that happened because they could go in and show very quickly that they were female, and they would say, you know, here's why we're here, and he, we're here to protect you and to keep you away from everything else that's happening in your home. And one night, uh, Cassie was out, and Cassie and her dad, you know, so many times we talk about... Um, uh, parents and the role of parents. And in this case, almost every one of these young women was in many ways closer to their fathers than their mothers, uh, or I'd say equally close. But they all had very special relationships with their dads who had always pushed them in the same way that they had pushed all their children. And that happened across the board. And Cassie, the one I was telling you about, who was the, uh, the ROTC cadet and the women's studies minor and sorority sister, she and her dad, you know, her, she and her dad would watch Fox News and read the Wall Street Journal together every single night, right? And when she got her phone back after selection, he was the first person she texted to say, I've never done anything I'm prouder of. I've just been selected for this team. And he texted her right back and said, I never had any doubt you could do it.
And so um, what you see is that, so she was out one night, and they said, hey, you know, they hadn't been able to clear the rooms because a teenage girl was screaming at the top of her lungs because they were taking her father, who was tall, uh, tall. And she was very close to him. And as, as anybody, when she's screaming, at, you know, well, don't take my father, and she's screaming every curse word at the American forces. And they said, hey, CST, get up here, because it's in the middle of the night, and there could easily have been, they could easily have gotten pinned down if, if other people are alerted that they're there, and it would have been much harder to get out safely, right? So she comes running up. The room hadn't been cleared. She goes straight into the room where the young woman is, and she has a conversation with her and says, look, I'm really close to my father, too. But here's what your dad's been doing, and here's why we're going to take him. And the girl spits at her and says every other bad word to her. But in the meantime, they can, they're having this discussion, and the rangers are doing their work, and everybody can get the heck out of there uh, one, once it's done. So I think that is where you see it make a difference. There's somebody to talk to. Uh, of the 200, 200 plus who applied, uh, and then the 55 who were selected. Uh, what was the officer enlisted breakdown? And then secondly, I can do two. Sure. Of the 55 who participated, uh, how many were wounded or, or killed uh, in their efforts? Well, I'm gonna ask one of our resident experts here. I think what I had seen was it was largely officers, so it was, but with maybe three quarter, one quarter, does that sound right to you? Three quarter officer, a quarter enlisted, more or less. Uh, on the direct action side, at least for, for Ashley's team, there were about 20, and I think there were three enlisted. Uh, and um, in terms of injured, uh, so two years, and this is an Ashley's award too, uh, two years uh, almost to the day after Ashley White was killed in a Kandahar province, uh, Captain Jenny Moreno, who was a nurse, who was also on a direct action mission alongside Rangers, very similar scenario. Uh, she was killed in action uh, and became the second CST um, to be killed on mission. Another of the village stability operations on the other side of the mission, which was special forces, uh, one of the young women lost uh, most of her leg uh, from an IED. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one more question right here in the middle. Uh, right, at, right at the beginning, you were talking about um, the general population of the United States not really being involved with the war. And on the other side, of course, you have operational security issues for the people fighting the war. Absolutely. Um, given that this is a sort of self-selected audience, and it's not really practical to have you give this lecture to everybody in the United States, how do you make the population more aware of what you've been telling us today? Thank you. You have uh, uncovered my biggest challenge and opportunity simultaneously. Um, the TED Talk about Ashley's War was really about the friendship and about what they were doing and about this group of young women. And I'll tell you what has been fascinating. The first two weeks that the book was out and was sort of everywhere at that point, John Stewart, Daily Show and, and Diane Sawyer and all this stuff, um, reader mail started coming in, and it was six to seven to one men. And I was so happy, and I was so surprised. And then I realized I shouldn't have been surprised because, by and large, who reads military? Who are the readers of military history? And for men, it wasn't actually at all a leap to read Ashley's War, as they wrote. You know, I mean, I had, you know, one gentleman uh, who's a veteran, actually, he bought 24 copies for his local VA in Florida and said it changed his life because the women in the VA had never seen themselves on a page. And it opened his eyes, and he ended up doing an art project, you know, series of lithographs. I mean, and we had experience after, I did IMIS, right? I mean, I got five or six more people writing and saying, this is a war story that has moved me beyond what I ever expected. And so what we found was that we had to then go back and talk to a lot of civilian women who had never picked up a war book before and really get into how these young women, to de-otherize women in uniform. And that is, to me, the ultimate challenge of a storyteller, right? I mean, the, the whole thing is we say, you know, we, we read to know we're not alone, and we write to make the personal universal. 
And so to make that story as universal as it is has been my real privilege because what I find now is a lot of book clubs are taking on Ashley's War. And you'll see if you look at it, reviews on Amazon, there are three or four who said, I would never have picked this book up if it weren't for my book club. And in fact, I didn't know if I really wanted to read it. But then I came to love these young women and to see that they were, that you know, and my whole point is these are your daughters, your sisters, your neighbors, your cousins, your friends. There is nothing different about them except that they push themselves to extraordinary limits in the service of a cause greater than themselves. And so that is a challenge I have really embraced, is to go into Silicon Valley at Facebook or at Google or at um, you know, universities which don't have ROTC programs and really have this conversation about what at the heart of the story is testing yourself, pushing yourself to extraordinary limits in the cause to something greater. And at the end of Ashley's War, and I'll leave you with this, there, there's a line where um, in two years ago exactly, on Veterans Day 2013, Ashley White and Captain Jenny Moreno became the first two women to have plaques on the memorial walk at the National Infantry Museum, even though women officially you know, remain barred from infantry. And at that service, Tristan, who was Ashley's replacement, and Kandahar and her dear friend. She said, when she went to Afghanistan, Ashley White was at the height of her life. She had a great husband, a supportive family, and a job she loved. And how much better would the world be if each of us, at the happiest moment of our lives, asked ourselves what we could do in the service of others? So I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much. Wow. I'm too short to stand behind the podium. Um, okay, anything I have to say right now is going to be inadequate compared to what we just saw. Uh, it is an engaging story, brilliantly told, and I think we're all lucky to have been here tonight to hear it. Uh, as um, two thoughts were going through my mind through the presentation. The first is that I'm currently reading uh, the biography of a Tuskegee Airman who, to this day, holds the Air Force's record for most combat missions flown. Anybody know that an African American holds that record? I didn't until just recently, and I've been an Army historian for a long time. Uh, in the 1940s and the 1950s, homosexuals in the US military were arrested and put in jail. Okay, That's another wall that has fallen. And now, partially because of women like Ashley and her sisters in these contact teams, uh, these support teams, uh, there are women now graduating from Ranger School, and that's another wall that is getting ready to fall. So again, an engaging story brilliantly told. And then the last thought that's running through my mind is I'm a father of two daughters, and also, just as importantly, of a son. And they all need to know this kind of a story because they need to know that what they set their minds to, they can achieve. And my daughter's here tonight so that she can hear this. So, did you hear that piece about uh, fathers and daughters? Okay. You still have to do your homework. So... As a father, as a soldier, thank you for telling this story, because it's a story that needs to be told. Uh, also wanted to present this to you as a memory. Uh, well, we're not quite Ted. <laughs> I think our mission is just as important, and uh, I hope this will gain a spot of pride for you. So thank you from the War College. Thank you from the U.S. Army Heritage Education Center.